Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Mark Willis Stewart, Executive Director of Beyond Borders, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank the first of four preeminent Scottish politicians who will be joining us over the course of this weekend. Uh, all of them have helped frame Scottish contemporary politics in the last few years. Um, and I want to say thank you, Ruth, for, for doing this. Whatever your political hue, I think we can all agree that Ruth's tenacious leadership and personality has helped stimulate a vigorous and political debate in Scotland. But, but I've asked her here to, today not to talk about Scottish politics at all, but to talk about an international issue of huge importance, something that uh, is important to Ruth personally, uh, Sebrenica, but also how the international community responds to such atrocities. So three, year, uh, three months ago I asked her whether or not she would swap her current profession for her former one, and she has agreed to do that and explore this issue with two veteran uh, journalists who, Ruth, I'm going to ask you to introduce. Alan Little is a distinguished broadcaster who, although he's now freelance, I believe, uh, spent much of his career with the BBC. He crisscrossed Europe uh, covering the collapse of communism for the Today programme. He reported during the first Gulf War both from Baghdad and from Kuwait. He was dispatched to the former Yugoslavia where he spent four years uh, telling us what was going on there and has written one of the definitive books on the subjects. A South Africa correspondent, uh, he also provided much of the BBC's output from the aftermath of the Rwandan genocide. And last year he ended his time at the BBC uh, as a special correspondent covering the independence referendum. So you can kind of say that we finished him off. So sorry about that, Alan. Um, similarly, Kate Eddy is a, a name, a face and a voice that's familiar to anyone that's watched news broadcasts at any time over the last 35 years. In her early career, she made her name covering the Iranian embassy siege, the bombings of Tripoli and of Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie. She was elevated to the BBC's chief news correspondent in 1989, a year when it seemed to many that the world had just exploded. And in her time uh, as chief news corps, she covered Tiananmen Square, the Gulf, the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone. Um, she also is a regular uh, contributor still to Radio 4's from our own correspondent. And if I can share just a, a little personal detail, um, she was my hero as a child growing up, and also the reason I became a journalist. And it's, this is this is quite the star-struck moment for me to be here sitting in a room uh, with her. Um, and for my part, Mark introduced me. I, my day job is as the leader of the Conservative Party in Scotland. Formerly, I spent 10 years as a journalist, mostly with the BBC. Uh, when I was a very young journalist, I was sent over to Kosovo to look at what Scottish troops were doing there in peacekeeping and nation building. And I've kept a relationship with the Balkans all down the years. I currently I'm one of the founder board members of a Scottish branch of the charity Remembering Srebrenica, Remembering the Massacre in Bosnia. And I was back there just you know a couple of months ago, just before the election in, in Srebrenica, Tuzla, Portokari, Sarajevo. So it's, it's an area of interest for me, both as an ex-journalist and as somebody who has an interest in the region. But I think what we want to try and do here is to look a little bit behind the curtain of what brings the news and war correspondency to your television and to your radio. Um, we'll have a bit of a chat uh, and then we'll invite some questions to the, from the floor. So if there's anything you've really wanted to ask these two, then please hold on to it for the end of the session. Um, the first thing, how do you construct what you tell people? How do you tell them what's going on when a war zone is one of the most mental places you could ever be? Uh, you can only give a tiny fragment of what's going on. You would be a fool if you attempted to say, this is the war. You see one small incident, you get a background, you travel around, you listen to voices, you ask questions, you use your own eyes, but you only get a fragment of it. And to give you an example of how that can be um, very difficult and how it's difficult to justify it sometimes, is that you take somewhere like former Yugoslavia, there were wonderful, wonderful landscape with hills and valleys and an extremely difficult, uh, lot, a lot of obstacles into getting round. There was fighting, uh, there was obstacles in the form of roadblocks with drunks and 
mines, or perhaps mines most of the time. There were criminal gangs. Uh, there were all kinds of difficulties. You could be in a valley, and you could look up the length of the valley in central Bosnia, and it looked idyllic. Uh, there would be um, uh, some cows grazing in the field. There would be the odd sort of villager. Not, no, no traffic on the road, because there's no petrol. But you would get a sense that this was peace. And if you were doing a story, let us say, in that valley that day, you would be completely oblivious of the fact that over in the next valley, they were burning the houses out and the people were being killed. And so you lived in terror that you were going to give entirely the wrong image of a war. Um, because you just couldn't cover the ground enough. So you determinedly try and travel around as much as possible. You try and make sure that the, the small incident you're doing is at least representative of what is happening in a lot of places. But you all the time say, I'm going to do this as precisely, accurately, and verified with my own presence there. I'm going to sift the information, because everybody lies in war. <laughs> uh, it's a fact. Everybody does, for very good reasons. It keeps you alive. Um, I'll explain perhaps that later. But the point is, you have to be sure of what you're seeing yourself. But then you must never make the mistake of thinking that this is the whole picture. You have to say, this is just one picture of the war. So, so Alan, I mean, people at home idea of war that they get from movies and films is one country versus another country on a, f on a field firing cannon at each other. And post-World War II and even in World War II, you know, that's not what war is now. It's dirty and it's skirmishing and it's complicated and something like Yugoslavia, because Britain wasn't really involved in it, you know, how do you even explain who the, the good guys are and the bad guys are or what the, the shades of bad are in a you, war like that? You have to go... To, um, we used to rent a house in, uh, in uh, central Bosnia in a town called Vitez, and a uh, big old three-story family home, and we, we were camping on the edge of the war, really, and the, the, uh, the ground floor was full of the detritus of television news gathering, and upstairs we had bedrooms where we you know, slept on floors and rolled up sleeping bags, and, and it was, there was one time in particular where you could, there was no light in the valley at night because there was no electricity. So it was pitch dark, but you could see across the valley. It was a beautiful valley uh, at the fires of the ethnic cleansing some nights, and it was eerie because you couldn't tell how far away it was because there was no, no no perspective, you had no sense of distance. So what you did was you tried to guess which town or village it was from the from the direction it was in. But in the morning you went there, you drove there to find out which town or village it was, and you tried to find the survivors and, and ask them the what, what had happened. And that's, we spent a lot of our time doing that. Um, in terms of uh, identifying good guys and bad, bad guys, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a, a determination throughout that war that all sides were equally guilty. The British government believed that. Many people in the UN believed that. The French government believed it. I never accepted it. I didn't believe they were all equally guilty. Uh, I thought from the beginning that the war was coming principally from one side. Yes, there were atrocities on all sides, but the war was coming principally from Serbia. And uh, the, uh, the analogy I always draw is if you go into a pub and there are two men arguing with each other, one is arguing with uh, utter conviction that two plus two equals four, and the other one's arguing that with, with similar passion that two plus two equals six, it's never right to say the truth lies somewhere in between. <laughs> which is the tempting thing to do because that sounds like your objective but actually it's part of your duty to make a judgment about the quality of evidence upon which an assertion is based and the quality of evidence upon which the first assertion is based the 2 plus 2 equals 4 is of a different order to the quality of evidence and what the second assertion is based so I frequently found myself in conflict with uh, desk editors in London certainly with diplomats and uh, and politicians from my own country, because I never accepted that the truth lies somewhere in between. And that doesn't mean, uh, though, that you see one lot as particularly virtuous, because all three sides lied, all three sides did uh, took part in actions which were grim and at times inexplicably horrible. Yeah. 
and all three sides tried occasionally to kill us. Yeah. Yes. So we didn't feel an automatic empathy. No, you're right. Way. <laughs> so none of that. Uh, the reason I said that people lied, I think this is a very important thing when you go into places where people are desperate and all the different groups and people who weren't even alive, uh, and that included, for example, a very large number of um, gypsies, of Roma, who weren't allowed to be part of the conflict because all three sides despised them. And one other thing is but, that the, 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 it's not only the three sides that were lying. Yeah. There, okay. there were some very good people who came with very good intentions mm -hmm. to try to make peace and who ended up lying as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you had to... Perhaps. Well, the Dutch. Well, we can, we'll, we'll talk about that. But there, were, but the, yeah. there, there, there was a de determination, certainly by the United Nations. I know there was one very, very senior and highly respected United Nations figure in the audience today. So I'm being careful what I say. Uh, he'll take me up on it later. But the United Nations began, to, offices on the ground began to spin it as well, very effectively. And uh, this, when we come on to talk about Srebrenica, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll give that. you the bit of spin. That was when um, one representative well, came into an airport. Uh, in North Bosnia, which had been under fire and needed a little bit of repair, and he announced the opening of the airport. He then flew out and it closed. Uh, that was the kind of thing we were faced with, this illogical, bizarre system. But it was all happening because of the problem that when people are very desperate, and I think we may forget it now that we live in such peaceful times, having had 70 years of peace, particularly in Western Europe, and specifically in our own islands, um, people who are desperate tell lies to save their skin very wisely. If you're in a village in the middle of Bosnia and people have just come and shot it up and they burned things and your people trying to defend it have had a terrible time and the bad guys have gone away again but they've said we'll be back tomorrow. When you ask them how did the fight go and this happened to me on several occasions they'll say marvelously we defended strongly, we're tough, we can resist. And you realize there were several old ladies, two young lads, and almost nobody else left in the village. The rest have scrammed. But they're not going to say, hello, we're weak, we're vulnerable. They're going to lie to you because their lives depend upon it. And so you have to have always this little sort of edge when you're listening to people to realize they may be telling you what they think has to be the truth for them, rather than the actual truth. And that happens all the time, because people are frightened, people are um, full of apprehension. Sometimes they're injured, sometimes they're bereaved. All of these things make them think, how can I survive? And it's a very, very important business in the whole um, sort of thinking of a reporter because you've got to remember, what am I going to put out about this? Because I can't lie to the audience at home. Well, that's a, that's a question, Alan. How do you, when you're in a situation like this, and day after day, and like you say, you see the fires at night, and you drive towards the embers in the morning, and you see horrendous things, and you have you know, the, the, the wailing and the, the keening of mothers who've had their sons systematically eliminated. How do you, day after day, want to tell these people's stories and not try and just grab the camera and scream down the lens? People are dying here, do something to help to the people back home. How do you keep that kind of professional glass in front of you? It's really, I know Kate will agree with me on this, uh, it's really, really important to remember that it's not your struggle. It's not your war. It's not your cause. And it's not your pain. It is not your pain, it's theirs. Don't take it from them. There was a colleague of mine who was covering a natural disaster not long ago, and he cried in a piece to camera. And I thought, it's not your pain, mate. You're a professional, you should be reining in your, save that for the bar tonight. Don't, it's not yours, it's yes. theirs. Don't take it from them. Absolutely, and um, the point is, if you put your story over properly, clearly, it is the people at home who have the right to feel an emotion yeah. when they're watching this. But if I can compare it, which isn't particularly um, uh, uh, an exact parallel, you wouldn't think much if you went to your local A&E and you took in injured children and the sister in charge of A&E started crying. Yeah. You'd like them to do the job. Mm -hmm. They're professional. It doesn't mean they're a hard heart 
battered old yeah. cow. <laughs> so, no, the point is that they have a job to do and you'd like them to get on with it. Now, journalism is not quite such a noble profession. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> it can be. It's a good trade. Yeah, it's a trade. It's and it tries a time to, to, to do good. But the point about that is that it is actually a job of work. And you have, in the midst of chaos, you have a lot of things to do because verifying the facts when people are demented, hysterical, or very, very distressed doesn't actually respond to the ordinary questions to find the facts. You've got to find a way around it. There's one other thing, so You Ruth. must be careful. Yeah, there's one other thing. That you might be surprised, because it took me by surprise when I first started experiencing it. Sometimes it's not the cruelty and the brutality and the suffering that, that, that distress you or make you provoke an emotion. It's, it's small acts of human kindness yes. in adversity yes. uh, or human dignity in adversity that crack you up. And, and I'll give you one example. In that first summer or the, the autumn of, of 1992, the first year of war in Sarajevo, I, I went to a, there was a hotel called the Hotel Europe, which is now the, the swankiest hotel in Sarajevo. At that time, it was a burned out shell. And some refugees had moved in there, but the, the walls were covered in soot and there was no proper roof on it and there were no windows, but they were living there. They were trying to make it their home. And I went to do a story on that. And there was an old man there, and he talked about how he had found an old mattress. He and his wife were sleeping on this mattress. He had two or three little bits of clothes hanging up on the, on the wall, and uh, he was making a go of it, trying to hold, trying to hold on to his life. And he was worried because winter was coming and there was, he thought they were going to freeze to death. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, and the thing that struck me first was he was wearing a tie <coughs> in the middle of this. It still, still makes me emotional to think of it. And I thought, he's not giving up. He's wearing a tie. He wants to be the urban, smart, educated man showing respectability to the world that he always had been. And uh, he said to me, you know what the hardest thing is? It's not the lack of food, it's not the lack of electricity, it's that we don't have contact with our daughters. They were in Zagreb. And so I said, well, I'm going to Zagreb in a couple of weeks, if you write their phone numbers down. He said, but they don't even know if we're still alive. I said, if you write their phone numbers down, I'll phone them when I get there. And he couldn't believe his luck. It was like some divine agent had landed from heaven and given him the, this gift. And he ran around trying to find a pen and a paper. And I said, no, just write it in my notebook. And he wrote in his own language. And the, the young woman who was with me translated it for me as he wrote, darling Vesna, please thank this kind journalist. Um, we're fine. And I just walked out and kind of cried my eyes out. And, yes. and, but I didn't put it in my story that I cried. I mean, I, 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 the story was about him. And I, I used him in my piece that day to, to illustrate the resilience of people in the, in the face of adversity. I didn't, I didn't cry on camera or you know, say that it had a profound effect on me. It's not my pain, it's his. And I, it would have been wrong for me to, 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 to steal it from him. I mean, where we're moving to is that there is much more personalized style of journalism coming in. And it is the sort which actually um, puts the reporter, it occurs to me, who is really a bystander. We are witnesses, we are not part of it, we are not the centre of the story, and what's happening to us? I mean, you know, you just don't me mention, I mean, if you want the ludicrous side of it, I once interviewed um, uh, Prince Charles uh, in Nepal while standing in a bog, and, and, and I don't mean the lavatory, I mean a real bog, uh, and I proceeded to sink during the... <laughs> But the point is, it doesn't matter what's happening to me. We need to hear from him. The audience doesn't care what's happening to me. By the time I was up to my knees, it was getting a bit difficult. You know, the but we are not the story. And I mean, we both hold this very dear. The, and what comes also very much with that, and people always ask about it, not only is it not our war, we haven't gone there to intervene or help. We don't take sides uh, in any physical way. There are acts of kindness occasionally, very small ones, weak, uh, and, and ones that are necessitous. But we're not there as an aid agency. No. We're not there as a medical team. We'd be rubbish at it anyway. 
Yeah. Well, we're, we're rubbish at it. And I always say, if people think we ought to, men, you know, sort of intervene when there are medical emergencies, if someone's been shot or hurt or seriously, and, you, you know, there's more than just you there, how would you like it if you were outside, you know, Waitrose? This is a Waitrose audience. <laughs> <laughs> It is if, you, if you had an accident outside Waitrose and you came round in some pain, you would not like, well, put it this way, you wouldn't feel the best if someone actually addressed you in Serbo-Croat. Yeah. You'd like someone to reassure you and say, don't worry, the ambulance is on its way, or you've just fallen over, you haven't had a stroke, etc. You don't want someone saying, ah, uh, me from. That's what we are in a lot of these situations. We are total strangers. We don't have those words. We don't have the language. We might pat someone's hand to reassure them, but we're pretty useless. We are the foreigners, and there's always people round about who are much better yeah. at it than us. Yeah. So when people think we're hard-hearted in not helping, we're not actually much use. No, that's right. There's, that's there's two things that I'd like to talk about before we open it to the floor, and, and one is about uh, the language that reporters use or the euphemisms that get created during conflict and how you report on conflicts or incidents that have happened a long time that you've only just discovered. And the second thing is to talk about how rolling television news has changed the job. So if, if we can go to the first one, um, if we use Srebrenica as an example, that happened in 1995. We didn't find out about it for a long time after. It wasn't until well into the 2000s that the International Criminal Court said that this systematic liquidation of 8,500 Bosnian Muslim men and boys constituted a genocide, the first genocide that a court had said had happened in Europe since the Holocaust. And, and how do you then contextualise for something, for someone who's only ever seen black and white figures at the liberation of Auschwitz on old newsreels, that a genocide has happened um, in a time when David Beckham was playing football for Manchester United under Alex Ferguson. People were running around wearing shell suits, and it was only a couple of years after Torval and Dean just down the road in Sarajevo had won gold with Bolero. How, how do you do that? How do you make people understand that it's in some way, you know, yeah. com comparative? I'm, Kate and I were in Sarajevo together once, September 1992, I think, and I'd been out all day, and so had Kate in our separate uh, ways. And I came back into the holiday in where we were staying, and you were there, and you said, don't even think about trying to get on the news tonight. I said, why? She said, Norman Lamont put the interest rate up by 2% this morning, then a further 3% this afternoon, and by five o'clock he put it back down again. <laughs> it was Black Wednesday. And there was no point. It didn't, this, the city was being yeah. shelled. The, you, so you're competing with that. Once in Sierra Leone, I was covering some desperate tr atrocity, and the desk editor said, you won't get on Alan. Cherie Blair's having a baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, 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 had, I had a very big story. Um, uh, at one point, uh, which I was absolutely desperate to get on, and I would, we sent it over, in fact. And I heard the producer the other end saying, I don't know why you're bothering. I said, why? He said, Princess Diana. I don't know, never mind. Yeah. I mean, royals, yeah. etc. You feel... So you're competing with David Beckham. But, but that's the way of journalism, because editorial um, decisions are not yours. You are the little beast out in the field the big bull back home and his big team, they make those decisions. And they may well make them, and this is a very serious point, I suppose, um, with due regard to the audience. Mm. Your audience isn't following, particularly with foreign stories and with stories which are full of distress and violence and awful scenes, which quite a lot of people do turn away from mm -hmm. in their living rooms. Your audience has got many interests in life, and most of them are closer to home. That's a fact of life. We aren't all marvelously universal, feeling strongly about you know, events in far off places, even though they may resonate very much around the world. You have to have a thought for the audience, and your big foreign story is often dwarfed by what, in universal, global terms, very small. Yeah, and a high-minded yeah. audience like this one gathered here today who's motivated enough to come to events like, br brilliant events like this festival, um, might say, say as a point of principle there ought to be more of this on the news. But actually the audience figures speak uh, speak very, very loudly and, and quite often uh, the audience turn off when it's a distressing war far away and, and that's just a fact of life and that, that judgment has to be made about striking that balance. 
Both of you are talking about trying to file for news bulletins. So it used to be that you would have the lunchtime news, the six o'clock, and then the nine, which became the ten o'clock. So you also, when there was an ongoing conflict, um, would have a sense of somebody making a decision of all of the different people that were on the ground, the embeds or whatever you, you, they used to be called before they called them that. And, and they would create this picture for the audience at night of what had happened that day in that war. Um, and in the first Gulf War, for example, you had that by the time the second Gulf War came along, you had 24 hour rolling news and actually what got put on television was where the camera was. And the camera might not be where the story was. Yeah, yeah. So have you seen a, a difference in what it is that you're asked to do and, and how you have to fight for it? An American journalist very wisely observed after the second Gulf War that what had been actually delivered, on, particularly on television, was a series of postcards home saying, here I am, <laughs> and that was the reporter. And that was not about the actual war. And that was very much the product of that kind of system. Yeah, there is a problem with the American networks now. They, uh, they, uh, and this was very evident in 2003, the American networks uh, increasingly, their news values, the, the, the values upon which their news is, is based, uh, are influenced by the entertainment industry. So American networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS, they very rarely show any foreign news at all that doesn't involve Americans. The American audience, there is a, 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 a sort of received wisdom that the American audience doesn't like stories in which Americans aren't winning. Uh, there were two or three very, very critically acclaimed novels, uh, not novels, uh, films, movies, Hollywood movies, about um, set in either the Iraq War or the Afghan War, and they bombed at the box office. And why? It's not that Americans don't like war, it's that they don't like losing. And this is a very important problem. It's why I, I am passionate about the need to preserve uh, public service, the ideal of public service at the heart of our own broadcasting topography, because it's, it's, it's died in America. But it is also under pressure in the rest of Europe and in this country. Well, I'm not going to let you off with that and just saying it's the Yanks fault, because I remember working at the BBC um, during the Second Gulf War and watching all of the, the, the 24-hour news channel coming in, and the one that sticks in my mind completely, and, and I was in the TA, I had lots of my mates that were over there fighting, so I was you know, ravenous about what was happening and where it was happening. And I remember, and I'm sure many people here will too, John Simpson had been out there, and it was before he'd liberated a town in his burqa, but he'd been out there, and there had been a rocket that had gone off near him, and his cameraman had been injured. Was and there was, there was a bit of, bit of stuff that came, there was a bit of blood that came onto the camera, and they ran that on a loop all day, even though actually it was miles from where, the, the narrative story was, yeah, and it's sure. because it looked good for the BBC. Look, look, television is worldwide. This is not about BBC, ITN, Sky, or the Americans. Television worldwide is under enormous pressure from the entertainment industry, which makes money. The entertainment industry is interested in larger audiences because that produces the larger profit. All the public service broadcasters from Australia to Canada, through this country and several others, are, are under immense pressure now because there is a, a received opinion, whether it is correct or not, amongst a lot of politicians in many countries and also a lot of business people, that uh, no public money should go to an outfit that doesn't get decent audiences. I use that phrase as a really woolly phrase, but the view is that you can't just actually dish out public money collected from everybody uh, to something which is just a niche audience. So the pressure is on to produce a television news which, as it were, is in competition with the entertainment. And if you wonder if it's happening, I can just take a few people back. I'm the dinosaur in the room, probably, but I do remember when news readers who were very small at the time. <laughs> uh, news readers used to sit very seriously behind a desk. Good evening. I shall just do this once. Now it's... <laughs> we want around the studio. It's part of the entertainment, sort of, uh, the entertainment shell of let us deliver something more watchable, more viewer-friendly, 
<laughs> this sort of thing is or pushing into your friends with actually female newsreaders, perhaps? Well, certainly not, but it, <laughs> everybody is doing it. That's what you have to realize. Everyone is doing it. Watch Jazeera or something. Russia Today is not too good at it, but you know, <laughs> the rest of the world is pretty well doing it. But it also connects to your point about emoting the idea that you should get more empathetic. And again, this is this ties in with this pressure. You can be more empathetic. You yes. must be more empathetic, yes. but it's not your emotion the audience okay. should be subjected to. It's theirs. But it's because of entertainment. It's because of the pressure. I listen to colleagues from Australia talking about mm. this, um, from, from France, from mm. Sweden. I keep in touch with reporters who say the pressure is on for us to join the entertainment Yeah, world. but Ruth, Ruth, just to And that's what 24 hours also, also news is. Something new every five minutes. One last that will bring in the audience so get thinking and get yeah, ready to be hands Yeah, because you're right yeah. not to let us off because there is a, 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 a serious point to be made. 2003, I think, was the height of the new thinking about the way broadcasting or television news in particular was going. The, tw the 24 hour news stations had, were still relatively young, but they were here to stay. And they were going to change the entire topography of, of television news. There would be no more built bulletins in the future. The, the, the scheduled running order was dead. The bulletins like the 6 and the 10 were a thing of the past and they would disappear. It would all be live and continuous. That was the thinking at the time. Everything was going to be live and continuous. That war taught us that there would be a need for and the public would expect a considered roundup, a considered summary of the most important events of the day mediated by a, by a small professional, by a professional team. Uh, and that that kind of fixture in broadcasting would survive the new way that people consume news and current affairs on their phones, on the internet, on their laptops, and so on. So I think there was a the the the, the, the tide turned in 2003 because of our experience of the Gulf War. We thought all we needed to do was put some live cameras in and just go live all the time. No, the audience said, I don't understand what's going on. I need somebody to produce a package of. A, a package of the day's news to, 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 to walk me through it. And the, the idea of the built bulletin uh, came back. But there's one other phrase, mm -hmm. and that is what lies behind some of the thinking now. Um, the Americans, who always neatly encapsulate what has happened in their media, rather better than us, came up with a phrase some years ago when actually looking at a new, building a new newspaper, which is USA Today which puzzles anybody who's ever seen it. It's very, not like a newspaper. But it is actually built on PR principles of finding out what people wanted rather than what editors thought was news. And up has come a phrase which is beginning to, I think, influence quite a lot of those decisions and how your bulletin looks. And it is called, All the News You Can Use. <laughs> think about it. It means that those faraway places are not really entirely relevant to you and your daily life. Uh, you think of the things you're interested in, or it affect your house, your children, your everything. That's the news you can use. And quite a lot, I think, of the thinking in newsrooms now is beginning to be influenced by that. And the people like us news, perhaps? If there's an ETA bomb goes off in Spain killing three people, that's a big deal. If there's a ferry disaster in Bangladesh that kills 200, it's not even news and brief. And there's nothing there new in this. The famous, headline, the famous yeah. headline is the 1930s, this massive earthquake in China, man from Burnley dead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's, let's let us open so to the floor. Nothing new. Yeah. Uh, we'll start off, I know we've got a couple of roving mics. If I could ask you to wait until the microphone comes to where you are uh, before you start asking your question. Um, if we take uh, the gentleman at the back there in the blue suit with his hand up first, and while he's speaking, if we can get another mic to the gentleman there with the, the beard and the, the sort of tan, tan jacket. Gentleman, gentleman here. There's, uh, there's another angle to that, all the news you can use, which might be considered Twitter. And I, I notice, Alan, you've got a, an account and you're admirably languid. I think you've tweeted three times in the last month. And Kate, I don't think you have a, an account, but I'm just interested in how you feel that Twitter is changing journalism in terms of all, all the news you can use in some ways it's, it's people are using Twitter to uh, validate themselves in terms of projecting news as stories that they can I think it's really important I think Twitter the advent of Twitter is much more important than, than Facebook uh, because it's putting power in hands that have never had power before it's a, it has the potential to be a tremendously democratizing force 
and I'm really excited about its potential. I'll give you one small example. I was sent to Liverpool to do a story about the campaign for justice for the uh, victims of the Hillsborough disaster. They were trying to get uh, documents out of the cabinet office, which they believed revealed something about what had really happened, and the government were refusing to release them. And they'd been campaigning for years for this, without much success. Uh, and a famous comedian, who is a Liverpool fan, tweeted, you can sign a petition to help the campaign for the, the Hillsborough victims. Within five days, it had 100,000 signatures and it forced the government to take action and the documents came out. The documents came out. The Burmese, uh, the, the, the changes in, in Burma, uh, something similar happened in the, in the 1980s to, 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 the, to the demonstrations led by the, by the, by the monks. No, we didn't see a frame of, of pictures from the 1980 uh, demonstrations because the government was able to control media. Governments can't control it anymore and that's a good thing. The danger, however, and this is definitely happening, is that people increasingly choose the voices they want to listen to. And Twitter becomes a kind of echo chamber in which you hear your own views reflected back to you by others. And there is, there is less and less of a public square in which we are exposed to views that we don't agree with. So it's, at the same time as it's making the world potentially more democratic and putting power into new places, it's also making the world less pluralistic. And I think that's a worrying aspect of it. I think there's also the possibility. What surprises students I talk to that there was censorship in this country during World War One and World War Two. They say, how dared they? And you say, war is almost automatic that forms of control are used by most governments around the world when they get involved in a major way in a war, and particularly if their own country is threatened. Um, there is absolutely nothing to stop governments getting control of and closing down all the means of communication which people now take for granted. We would be naive mm. if we thought they wouldn't try to do so. Any good hard look at the several million people employed by the Chinese government in suppressing information the Chinese government, mm. the party, finds inconvenient is out there and we can see it happening. Governments are not fans. I, 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 yeah, I was in Libya in 2011 when the, uh, when the bombing started and I thought, Ugh, why am I doing this again? Why am I here doing this? And I tried, to, I tried to log on to my Twitter account and I got a page that said, Twitter does not exist. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Libyan government, they found a way to close it down. So that's the caveat. And I think that people should always be very aware of the freedoms we take for granted have been hard won and need to be defended. Okay, if we take the gentleman there and then if we can get a mic round the front to Peter Devink that's here and then we'll take the lady with her hand oh, up a couple of rows behind her as well. Thank okay, you. thanks very much. I've enjoyed the discussion of uh, some of the ethics of journalism and my point is to that really. My experience of travelling in North Africa and the Middle East is that uh, television news doesn't share our inhibitions about uh, filming atrocious images um, when atrocities have occurred. We're living in times where unspeakable things are happening daily. I just wonder if our news judgments are right to protect us in the way they do, or whether it would be more appropriate for us to be able to see uh, atrocity and understand what's happening because I just feel sometimes we don't engage sufficiently with it. There's no right and wrong answer to this and what we're talking about is how much does the viewer at home um, tolerate, not how much the broadcasters tolerate in the end. Quite a number of people have said to me over fairly carefully chosen footage which I've um, been responsible for over the years has said, I couldn't watch. I can't watch any of that. I'm never watching the news again. There is a problem. If your news becomes a frightening hellhole of ghastly images, you can't actually expect people who don't wish to be surprised or they feel ambushed by it when they're sitting down to watch the news. You have to think very carefully about getting some kind of 
balance. Well, there isn't a balance. And we're now, of course, facing the stuff the, um, the from, from the appalling ISIS, violent murderers. Um, there is a level at which you have to put out information that is true to the story and somehow conveys what is going on. But that may not include the complete graphic images, which there's usually, now here I'm going into muddy waters, some kind of general consensus amongst us as to where some barriers are. That's why we have, with films, we, have, we try to say what's suitable for children and what's really violent, etc. Um, it, there is no proper answer, especially when the rest is turning up on the internet and is being watched by people. Because the danger is people are going to say, you, the mainstream broadcasters, are not telling the full truth. And it's a big danger. But I don't think the answer is to go wholesale into showing that footage, because I don't think everyone will be able to watch. And there are, the, the other thing to say is that, there are, especially at 6 o'clock at night, there are children. There are children watching, uh, exposed to it. and. Uh, you've got to be conscious of that. And uh, I did a story in 1991 in Baghdad during the, the bombing, and uh, there was uh, one morning when a civilian air raid shelter, which was hit by two bunker busting bombs, and hundreds of women and children sheltering in it for the night were killed instantly. Hundreds. And uh, the Allies said it was a command and control facility, that it was a military bunker. It was faulty intelligence, it was human intelligence that was, that was just wrong. And I was an eyewitness. To, uh, when I got there, there was, there was the, the recovery operation had just begun. I think three or four people survived it. And uh, the, we, were, we had to be very, very careful indeed about what we showed them. And, and, and a lot of the pictures that we sent back were taken out in London because they were too strong. And there was a, immediately a row about whether it was a military facility or not. And secondly, a row about how many had been killed. Because the Iraqis were saying 1,100 had been killed. And uh, the Allies were saying it was military. It wasn't civilians at all. So that woman there with the eye patch, Marie Colvin, I was with her. She's, she died a few years ago uh, in Syria. You might remember she was, I think, the finest eyewitness reporter of our time. And she said to me, we got to go to the morgue, Alan. we got to go to the morgue, count the, count the fucking bodies. And we did, the two of us. We went to the morgue and we counted. And we got to about 311 and we stopped counting because it was some, somewhere between three and 400. And so when people said to me, how do you know that there are somewhere between three and 400, I was able to say, because I've seen them counted them myself. I'm not relying on anybody else's That's how version. You define reporting. You're an eyewitness. But you um, couldn't have put the scenes that we saw on, on the morgue, in the morgue that day on the television. You just couldn't have done it. It was too graphic, too horrible. You didn't want to scare off your yeah. audience so it won't come back again. <laughs> how do you unpack that later? You know, six months in the line when you're out of country or that night when you go home and get drunk in the European hotel or I don't, I don't, I don't know, it. A very small dry sherry. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think we are? Speak for yourself, Kate. <laughs> I tell you what we used to do, and you would remember this. Um, I'm a great believer. I don't believe in, you know, the, the, sort, of, the, the sort of counselling being faced by some idiot who sort of says, oh, we've seen terrible things. What I really um, very, I feel very strongly about is at the end of the day, and we're lucky in television, we work in teams, and there's, we, on big stories there's a lot of you. You never let anybody go to bed silently who hasn't sat around the table, got hot food in them, and a drink mm -hmm. at the end of the day, because people will talk. Mm -hmm. And it's not it's a sort of mass counselling session, it's people talk. And you come back into being a human being and feeling that you've got friends, colleagues, and support yeah. around you. Yeah, and, and also humour. I mean, believe it or not, there's a great sense of humour in war zones, and it's very dangerous because it. We're often, not telling not, you what it's like. It's not the. It's not a sense of humour that travels. <laughs> but if you can make your colleagues laugh, Kate is a very, uh, as you can tell already, a very uh, a witty and amusing uh, dinner dinner companion, and it's always great to sit around a, a dinner table, even if it was only you know. 
stale humanitarian aid you were eating uh, because it's a good way of... I mean, I'll, I'll, Kate knows the story. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. A, a good friend of mine was recently judging a, a documentary <laughs> prize in, at the Cannes Film Festival in a cinema. And uh, the, the subjects were oh, ghastly, just one after another, ghastly, ghastly. And he was expelled from the uh, uh, audience for laughing. <laughs> and, and I said, why are you laughing? And he said, well, because one do there was one documentary and the voiceover said, this documentary raises one of the most compelling questions of our time. What makes a suicide bomber tick? <laughs> I just had the, I've just had the five minute warning, so what we'll do is we'll take these two questions together if that's all right. Peter first and then the, the lady behind. Well, first of all, could I thank all three of you for a most entertaining and fascinating session. Um, I remember, actually with horror, watching the Dutch army, in which I proudly served and did my military service, do the most appalling job in Srebrenica. They were dreadful. And then one day, I flew from Edinburgh to Schiphol, and lo and behold, there was the whole regiment coming in from wherever they had flown in. Funny enough, not into a military airport, but into Skip Hall. So I thought out the most senior Dutch officer, he was a major, and I asked him how was it possible that they could have done such a dreadful job in Srebrenica. And all he could say was they were powerless, and I can't believe that an army, a regiment of soldiers, could say something like that. You saw it on the ground, would you like to comment? Well, I'll just say briefly that I think one of the huge difficulties of our time is that um, we put our faith in written laws, rules, and agreements, and the UN is very much party to this, and many other countries. Also, there are rules of war. We also have now an international court just as the Americans and many other countries won't actually subscribe to it. But it's the way w human beings tolerate warfare. You say you can only go so far, otherwise it becomes a war crime. Killing someone that way is okay. Killing them that way is not. So that's how human beings tolerate warfare. Whether you approve of it or not is something else. Um, when you write the rules for the UN, I have to say they use a total mess. We had, I'm standing in front of appalling situations where military people said, is this a chapter six or a chapter seven? How far are we empowered to go? That is what those military people, only part of this argument, but we try and regulate it. And when you send people in with blue helmets, not as fighting troops, you are walking into a legislative minefield, which may mean that occasionally real minds go off and nobody does anything. I, I am more sympathetic, sympathetic to the Dutch guys on the ground than, than, than you are, Peter. Uh, I think that there is blame to be attributed, uh, but it wasn't that. I think they were largely powerless, and it was a huge trauma for all of them and for the Dutch nation, actually. It brought a government down. And uh, it's still it's still very raw in in the Netherlands to this day. Two years, but very briefly, when I heard that Srebrenica had fallen on the 11th of July, 1995, I was in Africa, and I woke up and I heard it on the World Service, and I immediately rang my foreign editor in London, and I said, "This is a catastrophe. I think hundreds of men will be taken into a field today and shot in the back and buried in mass graves. We should be making a big fuss about this." And my foreign editor said, "Let it go, Alan. You're in Africa now." It's not your concern anymore. We've got people on the ground, don't worry. Two years earlier, in April 1993, the fighters in, trapped in Srebrenica smuggled a note out with the UNHCR, who were rotating in and out, but, uh, asking the UN to come in and take the surrender and evacuate them to safety. The UN, for perfectly sound reasons at the time, didn't want to do that because they didn't want to participate in ethnic cleansing. Uh, and the peace agreement that was being negotiated at the time provided for Srebrenica to be part of a Muslim canton, a Muslim region. Now, 
So what they did instead was they passed a, a resolution at the UN uh, on, on cre of creating six so-called safe areas, of which Srebrenica was one, and they negotiated in Sarajevo a deal to disarm the defenders of Sarajevo, I thought, in April 1993, two years before the massacre finally happened. That, uh, at the time, I thought that, that, that they just signed their own death warrant, that the Muslims of the Srebrenica had si signed their own death warrant, and all the reporters in Sarajevo with me at the time agreed. And I wrote a piece for the BBC saying, we know what happens. We, uh, even I didn't think it would be thousands, I thought it would be, it would be hundreds. I said, we know what happens, because there's a pattern in this war that when the Serbs capture a civilian population, they, 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 they sort out the men they think are guilty of war crimes and execute them. It had happened all over northern Bosnia, all down the Drina Valley from 1992 to 1993. We knew that. So we knew the Srebrenica massacre was going to happen. And I wrote a piece for the BBC the next day saying, in April 1993, and it said, when Srebrenica falls, whether it's next month or next year, and hundreds of men are murdered and dumped in mass graves. Let none of us say we didn't know it was going to happen. I wrote that piece. I've still got it. The BBC wouldn't run it because they thought it was inflammatory and partisan. But I was beside myself with fury at this ineffective resolution and the way in which the, it, 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 it exposed an entire civilian population to mortal danger. And the, 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 the key culpability was committed then, when Srebrenica was declared safe but never made safe. And that was the decision made in New York. And one small point, the UN, when it goes in, it has blue helmets. It doesn't go in to fight yeah. most of the time. Yeah. It is hemmed in by regulations. Uh, the quality of the various people who contribute troops to the UN is variable to say the least. Some can be more violent than even the people locally fighting. That has been seen in places, particularly in Africa. Um, the second thing is that on the ground, you're assuming, aren't you, all as human beings, that others are horrified, the people amongst whom this is happening. One of the consequences of that first agreement about Srebrenica was something like uh, 40 or 50 truckloads of refugees did get out of Srebrenica. They came to the main northern town of Tuzla. I was there night after night. They were watched in stony indifference by their own fellow Bosnian Muslims because they were thought of as people from far away, not our problem. How do you make sense of this? Well, war, you don't make sense of war. Um, you often don't understand the full history, which is an absolute patchwork of historic violence, particularly in the Balkans. All we do, I suppose I'm saying this is order, is tell you what we see and what is happening and hope that cleverer people who have the reins of power take note and try and <coughs> make things better. But we watch it, and it's very rarely we can point a finger fully. Wars are a mess. They're a terrible and particularly human mess. Um, it's no good trying to neaten them up and sanitize them. They're a terrible, literally bloody mess. Um, what we have to do, uh, occurs to me as a personal view, is we have to be realistic, recognize it happens, the reporters tell us it happens, give us the facts, and then in a democracy, you do something about it. Every single one of us has a responsibility. And can I just say what an absolute privilege it's been to hear from both of our guests this afternoon. Much of what we think we know about the world around us is because of the work that they and their colleagues do and being back to us and being able to see behind the curtain and ask them questions. I think, I feel we've been all been part of something very, very special indeed this afternoon. Can you join with me in thanking you?